Hello and welcome to this after edition of Live from Nora Lab at Kit Peak. I am your host, Rob Sparks, and we have our moderator, Jamika Marshall, who will be monitoring the chat. Our guest today is Dr. Travis Rector, a professor of physics and astronomy at the Uni University of Alaska, Anchorage. Travis is going to talk about the process of creating uh, those beautiful astronomical images you see from raw data. First, I'd like to tell you a little about Kit Peak National Observatory. Kitt Peak is funded by the National Science Foundation and is a Noir Lab facility. It was founded in 1958, located about 55 miles southwest of Tucson on land leased from the Tohono Otham Nation. We are indebted to the Otham for letting us use one of their sacred mountains for astronomical research. Kitt Peak is home to over two dozen teles optical telescopes and two radio telescopes as well. We always start with a little news story here. Today, I'd like to talk about the final data released from the DESI, imaging, De Desi Legacy Imaging Survey. Astronomers using images from Kitt Peak National Observatory and Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile have created the largest ever map of the sky comprising over a billion galaxies. This is the ninth and final data release of the ambitious DESI Legacy Imaging Survey, which sets the stage for the groundbreaking five-year survey with a dark energy spectroscopic instrument which aims to provide new insights into the nature of dark energy. DESI, the DESI instrument has been installed on the male four meter telescope in Kitt Peak and is currently undergoing commissioning in preparation for starting the survey. If you're interested in learning more about the DESI instrument and the DESI survey, we did a, a previous live from NORLAB with Parker, Forge with a Parker Forgelius, I believe I pronounced the last name, where you can learn more about that. And you can look at our YouTube channel to see that in our show notes. Now I'd like to bring on our guest, Dr. Travis Rector is a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Alaska Anchorage. For over 20 years, he has made color composite images using data from the telescopes at Kitt Peak National Observatory, Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, and Gemini Observatory, which are now collectively part of NOIR Lab. During that time, he has made over 300 images. And if you want to see his images, you can go to the NOIR Lab webpage, noirlab.edu, to our image gallery. Just type in his name and magically up will pop all the images that he shows up in the credits. So I'd like to bring on Dr. Travis Rector at this point. Good afternoon, Travis. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Um, let me go ahead and get set up here. Okay. And uh, share my screen. So hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. And thank you for joining me today. So uh, so thanks to Rob and Jamika for inviting me to speak with you today. So as as Rob mentioned, I am uh, one of the people who makes many of the color astronomical images that you see from the NOR lab telescopes. And so what I'd like to do with this time with you is talk about the process that we go through and help you to understand uh, the images we make and why we make them. So to start off with, just want to tell a little bit about my own history. I came to Kitt Peak in 1998 as a postdoc research scientist at that time. And at the time that I arrived at Kitt Peak, they had just finished building a wide field imaging camera called Mosaic, which is a 64 megapixel camera that was used on the Kitt Peak 0.9 meter and four meter telescopes. Now, even today, a 64 megapixel camera is a pretty nice camera, but back in 1998, it was insanely large. And uh, in fact, one of the challenges with this camera was it was the files that came off it were so big it was hard to, to process the data with the computers we had at the time. Now, when this camera was built, we were interested in demonstrating the capabilities of the camera. In particular, we wanted to demonstrate the large field of view that it had. And so one of the first things I did with the Mosaic camera is make this image. And this is an image obviously of the moon. And what I did is I took a picture of the moon and then I waited a few days and I took a picture of the same location in space and then combined them together uh, with Photoshop to show the large field of view of this uh, camera. And we also made other images as well. And so here's an example. Uh, this is another one of the first images I made of the Rosette Nebula. And one thing I'll just mention real quickly is these two images are actually at the same scale. So believe it or not, the Rosette Nebula and many of the other images you see from space are actually of objects that would appear to be bigger than the moon if your eyes were sensitive, sensitive enough to see them. Now, when I first made these images, the purpose was to demonstrate the capabilities of this new mosaic camera, but we also found that there was a big interest in the public uh, in seeing these images. And in fact, the NASA Astronomy Picture of the Day website had just recently started. And so we found there was an audience for people who are wanting to see 
these images of space coming from our telescopes. And so uh, I continued to make images for Kitt Peak, and then I also started to make images for our sister observatory, uh, the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in the, uh, in the northern part of Chile, and also for the new Gemini telescopes on the big island of Hawaii and also down in Chile. And so uh, all of these observatories are now collectively part of what is now called Noir Lab. And so for many years, I was doing this on my own, pretty much as, wouldn't call it a hobby necessarily, but it was something that I enjoyed doing and continue to do on the side. Uh, but nowadays we actually have a team of people that, uh, that work on these projects. And so here's a list of the people in our team, including myself, who are working to make these color composite images. So these include people who are identifying data for us, processing some of the data, helping with uh, creating the color composites and, and, and also writing the, the uh, news releases that go along with them as well. So what I wanted to start off with was just simply talking about why do we make these images? Well, uh, the first and maybe most obvious is to help visualize science results. So at Noir Lab and like many professional observatories, we do press releases to share with the public the amazing discoveries that are being made with these telescopes. And so we like to have a color image to go along with the, the press release to help people to see what it is that we're talking about. Another thing that we often do is we, we like to demonstrate the new technologies that are being used on our telescopes to show off what our telescopes are capable of. And then also just simply to make color images that show the amazing universe that we live in. Now, this third category is actually a relatively small one in the sense that m the far majority of time on our telescopes is used for scientific research, is to collect data to advance our understanding of how stars and galaxies and other things in our universe work. But we do get a very small fraction of time on our telescopes to just simply look at beautiful things and to make color images to share this with people. So here are some ex uh, recent examples of, of, of press releases and other images that we've made in these different categories. So as Rob mentioned at the start of uh, today, that uh, there was a, a, a new data release for what's called the DESI survey. And so the color image he showed is an image that a color composite image that we made from the data from that survey, just to show the quality of the data and the kinds of things that can be seen in it. We've also recently made images to show off the, uh, the capabilities of our adaptive optic systems on the Gemini telescopes. And so the image, uh, these two images show how the adaptive optics are able to sharpen the images and give us resolutions that are very similar to what the Hubble Space Telescope can do in space. So the image on the left here shows what a particular part of a nebula looks like without adaptive optics, and the image on the right shows what we can see with the adaptive optic system. And then here's an example of a color image that we made that was just simply intended to share uh, people the amazing things that our telescopes can see. And so this is a recent image we released from uh, data collected with the Gemini uh, telescopes. So over the years, I've had the, the, the privilege and pleasure to make these images, and I've also had an opportunity to talk with people about them. And nine times out of 10, when people see these images and they have a chance to ask about them, the first question people ask is, are these images real? And so, I re, uh, so this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon I love because it talks about the skepticism that a lot of people have when they see images. You know, we live in a world with science fiction movies with source, all sorts of amazing graphics. So if you see an astronomical image, how do you know that it can be real? And so people often ask me questions like, is this what it really looks like? Or are the colors real is a very common question. Or uh, one of my favorites is, if I were standing right next to this, is this what I would see? Now, never mind the fact that you can't really stand like right next to a galaxy or a nebula. All of these questions basically are asking about is the object real? And in particular, is this what it would look like to you if you were closer to the object? And so to illustrate this, the answer to this question, uh, here's an, uh, an image that I made with this mosaic camera I was talking about earlier of a famous nebula called the Horsehead Nebula. Now this is a nebula that's about, about 2000 light years away from us. So let's imagine you were able to get into a spaceship and fly all the way out that distance to the horse head. Now, once you got close to the horse head, let's imagine you looked out the window 
to see if this is what you would actually see. Well, this is not what you would see. This is what you would see. So it turns out that for extended obje objects like galaxies and nebulae, that if you can't see it from here on Earth, you're still not going to be able to see it if you get any closer. And this has to do with something called surface brightness. So as you get closer to an object, the amount of light you get from it increases, but it is spread out over a larger area. And so those two cancel each other out. And what it means is, is that if you can't see it uh, from Earth, you're not going to be able to see it even if you get closer. And so when people ask me, does this image really show what something looks like? The answer is no. Nine times out of 10, it doesn't. Unless we're talking about like solar system objects. If we're talking about like galaxies and nebulae, these objects in general are too faint for our eyes to see. So this picture right here is what your eyes would see. So one thing that's very important to know about telescopes is not only can they magnify images to show us things that are very faint or very small and make them look bigger, they also amplify the image. They make things appear brighter so that uh, we can actually see them. So there's actually a variety of reasons why the answer is no. The first is this concept of surface brightness that I mentioned. It also turns out our eyes are really bad at seeing color. And in fact, most of the stars you see in the night sky are too faint for you to actually see the color in them. Uh, there are a few examples like Betelgeuse, a red giant in the constellation of Orion. It's bright enough that you can see that it has an orangish color, but most of the stars are too faint and just appear to be black and white. It also turns out our eyes are really bad at seeing red light. And perhaps most interestingly, there's these all these other kinds of light that our eyes can't see. And so there are things like infrared light and x-rays and radio waves and ultraviolet light. These are all kinds of light that our eyes can't see, but we can build telescopes to be able to see them. And so to give you a, a sense of perspective, uh, one of my colleagues uh, named Kim Arkand at, at Chandra X-ray Observatory has a really great analogy. She says, imagine you have a keyboard with 88 keys on it, and imagine you could only hear one of those keys. Well, that's kind of how our eyes are. There's all these different kinds of light out in the universe, and we can only see a very small fraction of them. And so it's analogous to if we can only hear middle C on a piano. Now, the good news is, is we can be, build telescopes that can see these kinds of light, and it allows us to see the universe in ways that our eyes cannot. So when people ask, is this image what I would see? The answer is no. And the reason why is because we use telescopes to give us the ability to see things that are often literally invisible to us. So telescopes give us superhuman vision. And these color images are a translation of what the telescope can see into something our eyes can see. So how do we do it? Well. One thing to know is, especially when we're using uh, optical cameras, like we do on the NOIR lab telescopes, optical and infrared cameras, these cameras only take pictures in black and white. And so here's a picture, an example. This is uh, a picture of the Crescent Nebula taken through one of our telescopes. So our telescopes themselves don't see color. So the way we produce a color image is very similar to what our eyes do. Now, the way our eyes see color is we have detectors in the back of our eyes called rods and cones. And the cones are what allow us to see color. And we actually have three kinds of cones in our eyes, which correspond roughly to red, green, and blue light. And the way that you see color in something is by the relative amounts of light that you see. So for example, my sweater looks green because the green cones in your eyes are excited or stimulated more than the other colors. And our brain knows how to process the information from our eyes and determine what the color is. And we can do something very similar with our telescopes. And that is we can take pictures through red, green, and blue filters that are very similar to what our eyes can see. And images that are made in this method are often called natural color images because to a certain degree, they mimic the way that our eyes see color. So here's an example of a natural color image, uh, the same crescent nebula that I showed you before. But another thing that's important to know is, is that our telescopes have other kinds of filter that don't correspond to red, green, and blue. Many of these are filters that can see kinds of light that are beyond what our eyes can see in the ultraviolet and the infrared. And we also use what are called narrowband filters. And these are filters that are designed to see 
very specific colors of light that are produced by different types of gas. So for example, hydrogen gas, when it is warmed up, produces a very specific color of red light that we call hydrogen alpha. And other types of gases produce specific colors as well. And we have all these different kinds of filters that allow us to see just those particular types of light. And on Kitt Peak, there's something like 100 different kinds of filters uh, that we use on our telescopes in one form or another. So one of the techniques that we use when making these color images is actually to make color images using more than three filters. And so this is an example of that. The image, uh, these are two images of a galaxy called NGC 6822. And the image on the left is what the galaxy looked like when taken, when a picture was created using three filters of red, green, and blue. And the picture on the right is what the same galaxy looks like when we actually used eight filters. And by using more filters, we were actually able to bring out more detail and see what's going on inside the galaxy uh, more vividly. So the way that it works is we take images through each of the different filters. And again, the camera itself doesn't see color. It only produces a black and white image of what it sees through that filter. So here's a picture of a nearby spiral galaxy called M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. And this is what this galaxy looks like if it is looked at through a blue filter. And what I want you to notice here is that uh, you see a lot of stars in it. In particular, you see a lot of hot blue stars that are in the image. Now, this is a picture of the same galaxy, but taken with that hydrogen alpha filter. As I said before, hydrogen alpha is a specific color of red light that's produced by warm hydrogen gas. And by using that filter, we can actually see the warm gas inside this galaxy where stars are forming. So notice that these two look very different. Now, the way we create a color image is, is we take black and white images through each of the filters, and then we assign a color to each of the different filters. And in this case, since this is hydrogen alpha, we make it a, uh, we make it a, red, a deep red color that's very close to what your eye would see if you were to look at this gas and it were bright enough for you to see it. Now we also use other kinds of filters. And so for example, for this galaxy, this is a picture of this galaxy using what's called an I-band filter. And I stands for infrared. And so this is a range of light that our eyes can't actually see. And so a good question to ask is, is well, what color do we use when we're talking about a kind of light that's invisible to us? And it depends on the image that we're making, but in this case, I chose the color orange. Now I didn't use red because I'm already using red for the hydrogen alpha filter. And I want every color for each filter to be different so that we can see the detail that each filter gives us. And then using other filters, this is uh, what this galaxy looks like through what's called an R band filter. And then V band, V stands for visible, it's a green filter. And then a blue filter, and then finally here, this is a filter called the U-band filter and U stands for ultraviolet. And this is a kind of light our eyes can't see, but it is close to violet in the spectrum. And so we used a violet color here. So in this image, we have six filters and we combine them together and we get this color image. And so by using six filters, we can see detail in the galaxy really nicely. So you can see these red areas, these are, are star forming regions, clouds of gas inside the galaxy where stars are forming. And you'll notice that if you look at the stars, you'll see that the stars come in a range of colors. And not only is it uh, pretty to look at, the colors actually tell us information about the stars and other things in the galaxy. So for example, with the stars, the color actually is able to tell us the temperature of the stars. The hotter stars are bluish white in color, whereas the cooler stars are yellowish to orangish in color. Now we use this exact same technique when we make images using kinds of light that our eyes can't see. So for example, this is an image uh, that was produced using the Gemini telescopes looking at infrared light. And infrared light is a kind of light that's too low of energy for our eyes to be able to see. But we can build telescopes and cameras that can see it and so I'm gonna show you an image that we made by taking pictures in the infrared and each using each filter uh, that was looking at a different range of energies. And what we do is we assign colors based upon the energy of light. 
Now, it's the kind of light that our eyes can see. Red is the lowest energy light and blue and violet is the highest. And so we use the same principle when we look at other kinds of light. So this is a picture using low energy infrared light, which we made red. And then uh, higher energies, we made green and then cyan and then blue. And when we combine the four together, we get this color image. So in this image, the objects that look reddish in color are producing more low energy infrared light, whereas the objects that are bluish and whitish in color are ones that are producing more high energy infrared light. And so it's very similar to what we saw in the, with the visible image of the Triangulum Galaxy, but it's using infrared light. So one of the really cool things here is, is that we have all of these different telescopes and we have all these different kinds of cameras and filters that can look at all these different colors of light. And so we have all these different ways of putting together color astronomical images. And so early on in the process, we recognized that we can make images in kind of almost any way we wanted to. And so we started thinking about well, what is the best way to make images? How can we make color images that are accurate, that they correctly show what these objects look like, but also tell us a little bit about the science of them. And so we started uh, using a technique called visual grammar, which is a way that our eyes interpret an image. And so visual grammar is basically the way we read an image. And so we can use the technique of visual grammar to help guide us in the way that we create a color image. So, <clears throat> Uh, just go, to go through an example here, I want you to look at this image of this field that you're seeing right now. And I'll just mention that when you're looking at this image, and when, frankly, when you look at anything at all, your brain is already processing the image and is creating a three-dimensional model of what it is that it sees. And so when you look at this image, your brain has already, even though the image is flat, your brain has already uh, interpreted the image to understand what it is three-dimensionally. And so looking at this image, I want you to ask yourself, which part of this image do you think is closer, the top half or the bottom half? Now, as you look at this image, uh, most people will just instantly say, oh, the top half is further away than the bottom half. Now, the tricky part of it is, is asking yourself, how do you know that? And it turns out that our brain uses a lot of different visual cues. And so one example of those visual cues is, is we're looking at things that we're familiar at. We're looking at trees and those trees have leaves. And so the trees on the bottom half of the image appear to have bigger leaves than the trees behind them. And so our brain naturally interprets these two objects as being the same but the ones that have the bigger leaves must therefore be closer. Now, another visual clue that's very important here is the color. Now, the top half of the image looks bluish, and the reason why that is is because of the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere, of course, is blue, and that's because as light passes through, as sunlight passes through the atmosphere, scattered light causes the atmosphere to look blue. And so when we look at things off in the distance, those objects will look bluer in colors. So our brains know that if something looks bluer in color, it is likely further away than something that is reddish or yellowish. So looking at this image, our brain can naturally interpret that the top half is further away than the bottom half. Now for comparison, when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, there was no atmosphere. And so they lacked that very important visual cue. And it turns out the, the astronauts actually really struggled to figure out where they were at times because they had difficulty interpreting the lunar landscape. So for example, this picture, you see the lunar lander on the right and you'll see behind it, there is a hill. Now you can trick your brain into thinking that's either a relatively small hill that's just right behind the lander or that maybe it's a very big mountain off in the distance. And just from standing at this perspective, it can be very hard to tell the difference because without that visual cue, of the atmosphere, uh, it's very hard to see. And so the Apollo astronauts did talk about how it was challenging for them to walk around on the moon and figure out where they were simply because they lacked that visual cue. Do we have any questions so far? I see, um, yes or no? Yes, we do, fantastic. Okay. 
Go ahead, uh, Jamaica. Travis, Let me know what some of the questions are. Yeah, this is a fantastic topic and 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 definitely really interesting for sure. I'm I'm really glad to get the explanations on how you create uh, some of these amazing images that that we see all the time in our press releases, Travis. Thank you. Okay, so uh, here's a couple of questions. First question: What are some examples of typical exposure times for these images? And the second question is. Are those exposure times the same through all of the filters? Okay, so when it comes to exposure times, first thing to know is, is we usually take many exposures and then we're able to combine them and it effectively simulates if we, what would have happened if we just took one exposure. So maybe instead of taking uh, one 30 minute exposure, we will take five six minute exposures. And there's a variety of reasons that we do this. One is, is that let's say something goes wrong during the exposure, uh, the telescope has problems or the camera has problems, which can happen occasionally. Rather than losing all 30 minutes, we'll lose just maybe those few minutes. There's other reasons why we like to take multiple images. It helps us with the processing of the data. But typically, um, well, I'll just say that, they can, that the exposure times can range wildly, just depending on what type of object we're looking at. So if we're looking at a very bright object, like a planet, the exposures can be a fraction of a second. But when we look at faint objects like galaxies and nebulae, we often uh, use exposures of you know, five to 10 minutes, and we may stack many together. And it really depends on just what kind of object it is and how much data we have. Now, one of the biggest challenges we have is just how much time we have on the telescopes. Often we may only have an hour or two at most to make an image of an object. And so we have to decide how much time we, we, want, we want to spend with each exposure and each filter. And that gets to the second part of the question, which is what are the exposure times for each filter? And that can vary a lot depending on what kind of filter it is and what kind of object we're looking at. And so in general for narrow band filters, since they don't allow as much light to pass through, we tend to use longer exposures for those. And for the broadband filters that may allow a lot of light to come in, then we may use shorter exposures. So for an example, uh, for making an image of a galaxy, we might use 30 minutes of exposure time for the hydrogen alpha filter, and maybe only five or 10 minutes for one of the uh, broadband filters. Thank you so much, Travis. Sure. I appreciate that uh, very detailed um, response. Um, we also have um, lots of uh, comments here. Just uh, we have we have people from Istanbul. We have people here from Colombia, Bogota. We have people from Tennessee, from Indiana, and they're sure. all very into what you were saying. So that was a great question, and I know we're gonna I know we're gonna have some more questions for you a little bit later. So I'll okay. jump back in once I do. Thank you, Travis. Fantastic. Just pop in when you have more questions. Sure will. Okay. So I'm going to continue to talk about visual grammar. And now what I'd like to do is talk about how we can use these rules, the visual grammar, and helping us create color astronomical images. Now, one of the biggest challenges we have with our astronomical images is that we're looking at objects out in space that can be very different than the kinds of things we're looking at here on Earth. And so we often lack the visual cues that we have when we're looking things on your earth. We don't have trees in space or mountains or things like that. And so we try to use visual grammar to help create an image that people can look at and understand. So this is an example. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the thing I really love about this image is how the colors work in it. And this image just feels so three-dimensional to me because the ways that the colors work together and the way that the structure works in there. And so uh, people often ask me, does the Hubble Space Telescope, do, do your telescopes at NOAA Lab, can they see three-dimensionally? And the answer is no, they don't have stereoscopic vision, but the way that we use color in creating these images often does give a three-dimensional feel because the images are made in a way that our brains can understand. And so looking at this image of the Lagoon Nebula, it just feels so three-dimensional. I mean, the, the bluer areas feel like they're in the background, just like blue areas on the earth feel like they're in the background. And so this really does feel like a place that is real and you can go in and explore You can imagine this looks like kind of like the caverns in a cave or maybe a cloud. 
So there's a lot of visual cues in this image that help us to understand what we're seeing. And it gives the viewer familiarity or uses the familiarity they might have with things here on earth to help them understand it. So some of the most successful images we make are ones that are accessible. That is our brains can interpret it and understand what they're seeing. Just for an, an example, this here is a side-by-side -side of another image from the Hubble Space Telescope. This, this image shows the Keyhole Nebula in color on the left and uh, in grayscale or black and white on the right. And, you know, I love the black and white image, but the color image just, the color adds so much to it and it really helps us understand what we're seeing. The grayscale image on the right, the black and white image just feels more abstract and, and it's harder to understand. It feels more like a Rorschach test than an actual nebula in space. Now, another thing that we use this part of visual grammar is color also gives us a sense of temperature. Uh, in many cultures, uh, in most cultures, we associate red with something being hot and blue with something being cold. And that comes from our daily experience with red flames and with blue ice. But it turns out in astronomy, it's often the other way around. The blue things are the hotter things. As I mentioned earlier, the blue stars are the hottest stars and the reddish stars are the cooler stars. So one of the things that we try to do is we try to work with the brain and help it use how it sees things to understand what it's seeing. And I'll just share here uh, an example of an optical illusion. I love optical illusions. I love that sensation of seeing something in a way that's uh, that just kind of short, short circuits what the brain is supposed to do. And so these optical illusions often show how our brain is functioning and how it interprets things and how that can, and that can lead us astray and be confused. And so here's an example of a Veritasium video from a few weeks ago that really illustrates this very nicely. So when we create a color astronomical image, we first think about what is the story? What is the science here? When someone looks at our image, what are they gonna take away from it? If we were to talk with them later on about what that was, what will they remember? And so the first thing is, is we want, to, we want to convey the science. And so here's an example of us doing just that. Uh, these are two pictures of the same galaxy that I showed before, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. The picture on the left shows what it looks like using data from Kitt Peak telescopes, using only optical light. The image on the right shows the same image, but now we've added radio data from the Very Large Array Radio Telescope in New Mexico. Now, radio telescopes are, are another powerful tool in astronomy, and one of the things that they can be used for is to see cold hydrogen gas that is invisible to our optical telescopes. And so in creating the color image, we asked ourselves, what color should we make the radio waves since they are invisible? And the color that we settled on <clears throat> was violet, or this purple color. And the reason why we did that is that it is a mixture of red and blue. And so when we combined it with the optical image, the red and the, and the, and the uh, hot hydrogen gas that produces the hydrogen alpha blended well with what we saw in the radio data. And we wanted that because these are the same type of gas, is this hydrogen gas. The only difference is, is what's shown in the radio image is colder. And the blue there helps convey that, that the, this gas is indeed colder. So when someone looks at this image, our hope is, is that they will naturally intuit that the purple gas inside this image is connected to what is colder than the red gas inside the image. And that's actually true. It's the same type of gas. It's both, they're both hydrogen. It's just what the radio telescope shows us is colder hydrogen gas. Jamika, I see you're back. Do you have more questions or comments? Yes. Travis, thank you. I do have another question from Mustafa in the chat. And Mustafa has a couple of questions. The first one is, what is the difference? Actually, what are the differences between images taken with a, a monochrome CCD camera, but using a BV, uh, BVR filter and an RGB CCD camera? Which one would have more details? And he says, thank you. Okay, well, both are ways that you can produce color images. So some cameras have what are called RGB cameras already have the filters pre-installed on, on the optics of the camera itself. And so like 
the, the color camera on uh, like on your phone or a DSLR already has those filters built in. So you don't have to worry about using filters when you create a color image. But another way to make it, and this is the way we make our images in general, is by using filters of different colors. And so as mentioned, B, V, and R for blue, green, and red. And it really, both are effective ways of making images. It just simply comes down uh, to what telescope you have, what cameras you have, as to what kind of detail you're gonna see. And so I wouldn't say that one technique is better than the other. Okay, any Thank more questions you, or should I move on? Um, no, that was that was it for 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 Mustafa's question. But I do have another question if I can pose it to you now. Sure, please go ahead. Which is um, how does the process that that you use for for processing these images that you've been explaining compare to the process that say someone doing amateur astrophotography would do? So the processing is, is very similar. And I'll say that there's been a lot of contact and overlap between those communities. And we've learned a lot from working together on a variety of things. Uh, there are some differences. The, the biggest difference I think is simply that we often are making images uh, using multi-wavelength data. So making data outside the visible range, which is something in general amateur astronomers don't do. Another issue is, is that we in general have larger telescopes and so uh, we can often collect more light and we have a lot of uh, many kinds of filters that maybe amateurs don't use as well. But there's actually quite a bit of overlap in the techniques that are used for making amateur astronom astronomical images and the professional ones. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Travis. Okay. So the last thing I'd like to talk about here before I move on to just opening up for questions and discussion is often I get asked uh, whether or not what we're doing is is art. And, and the answer is yes, but I want people to understand that when they hear that, they think they often assume that there's a difference between science and art. And that if you're doing something scientific, it can't be artistic and vice versa. And what I wanna emphasize here is, is that we're using artistic principles like visual grammar and composition and, and things like that to help us to tell a scientific story. So we make these color images to be scientifically accurate and to tell a scientific story, but we also want them to be beautiful. We want them to be aesthetically pleasing. We want our images to be something that really pop out and capture someone's attention and imagination and some, give them an opportunity to look at them and explore them. But one of the things that I'm really proud of is, is that often our images actually are used for scientific purposes. Usually it's the other way around. Usually we get scientific data, we come up with results, they're published, and then we'll create a color composition, composite image to illustrate the science that was done. But sometimes we make a color image and that actually leads to science. And so here's an example of that. This is a color composite image of an object called the Iris Nebula that I made many years ago using the Kitt Peak four meter telescope. And after creating this color image, I looked closely inside and I noticed that there, there were these little red smudges inside the data. And these red smudges are what are called herbig harrow outflows. And what was really interesting about the way that uh, we made this color composite image is it made these outflows, uh, which were very hard to see because they're embedded inside this nebula, uh, pop out and be visible. And one of the things I think is interesting is because the way this image is made, it works with our brains to help us interpret what's going on. And so we can see these, these very narrow outflows of, of gas that are embedded inside this nebula. And so it helped lead to some interesting science. And uh, we were able to use data from the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope. And we were able to identify what was the progenitor or the source of these outflows. And it's a cluster of stars marked here with this, this plus that uh, when we created a color image using the Spitzer data is shown right here as type group V. So this is an example of how we can actually use color images to advance science as well. So uh, Rob has already mentioned this, but I'll mention this again. If you are interested in seeing the, uh, the astronomical images that we produce using the NORA lab telescope, you can just go to the NORA, NORA lab website and go to the images section and it'll give you a gallery of all the many images that we've made over the years. And this gallery also includes many images 
of our telescopes as well. So you can see a lot of the, uh, the amazing views uh, from our observatories. And I'll also just throw in a shameless plug uh, for a book that I wrote some years ago with my collaborators, Kim Arghand and Megan Watsky at the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And the book is called Coloring the Universe. And it is about many of the topics that we've talked about uh, in the in the talk that I've talked about today, but goes into more detail about how the different telescopes work and the, uh, all the ways that all the steps that go into making the color images. So if you're interested and want to learn more, uh, please check it out. So with that, I'm going to conclude my talk and end uh, uh, stop sharing my slides. And I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions or comments that um, uh, that might pop up. Fantastic, Travis. Yes, we have some more comments and questions for you from the YouTube audience. And I'd like to say thank you, everyone who uh, are with us today, whether you actually post a comment or question in the YouTube chat or not. We appreciate all of you being here to support our program and to learn about how we bring amazing science to you in the form of these beautiful images. Okay, so comment from Don Bladow. Um, he says, I'm always amazed how you make such technical information understandable to a layperson without the background. You are exceptional as an instructor because of this attribute. Um, and that's from Don. Um, thank you, Don. Don's a friend of mine. So thank you very much for your kind words. I appreciate it. Definitely, and I can certainly uh, agree with that. The way you've explained how this process worked, given us the background to why you even do this, um, is for me really insightful and and definitely easy easier to understand. I think than just me trying to read it on my own in a very technical way. You broke it down for us, Travis, so we actually know what's going on. Well, thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate your kind words. Mm hmm. Okay, and now we have Liz Flemings from Memphis, Tennessee, and she says, how can a novice photographer get the best solar images with the right equipment? Uh, she says she's in Tennessee, so what would be the best time to get good images? Well, I have to admit, I've never taken images of the sun, so I may not be the right person to ask. I usually wait till the sun's out of the way before I start taking photos. Um, First, I'd say is wait till the sun is high in the sky. You, uh, when the sun is low on the horizon, you're looking through uh, much of the, the Earth's atmosphere. And so that can make the image look blurry or distorted. And the other thing I'll mention is take lots of photos because the Earth's atmosphere is constantly changing. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit more blurry and times a little bit less blurry. And so if you take thousands of images and then go through them, you'll find that every so often, one of them will just look just right. Like everything is worked out and the image looks razor sharp. So those are, those are two techniques you can use to hopefully take better images. I, I can add to that a little bit, Travis. Yes, I please do. McMath Pierce, the McMath Pierce Solar Telescope on Kitt Peak, they tended to take images uh, sort of mid mid morning before it got too hot, before the Earth's atmosphere got stirred up too much. So like you said, let the sun get high enough in the sky, but before it gets too hot out, before you get too much turbulence in the atmosphere, so their their sweet spot of imaging for the day. They rarely did imaging late in the afternoon when the air was much more turbulent. And like you said, lots, lots of short exposures. So get a camera to take lots of short exposures so you can stack them. Maybe we'll do a oh, right. maybe we'll, maybe we'll do a amateur photography one sometime for this. That would be yeah. fun, actually, to go through that process and actually see how that works. That's a good point. Thanks, Rob. Yes. All right. So hopefully, uh, Liz Flemings, that uh, was a good answer for you. Uh, definitely jump into the chat if you need more clarification. Okay. So um, we have also a comment from John Mora. John says, thank you. Sometimes, uh, thank you. Sometimes we're trying to capture very faint or high magnitude celestial objects. We still have a star with blooming. And so he asks, how much do you consider to be appropriate or allowable for the blooming? And he says, thank you. Um, first, Travis, what, what is blooming? So blooming is what happens is, is if you have a very bright star in the image, uh, if you think of like each little pixel in the camera is like a little light bucket that's collecting light from the different things it's looking at. Blooming is basically what happens when the buckets fill up and it starts spilling out into the other buckets. And so what you'll get is you'll get these horizontal lines that streak out. And 
Um, the, the answer to the question is, is, is sort of depends. If you are trying to see something that's very close to the where the blooming occurs and you don't want the blooming to uh, affect it, we may take many shorter exposures. But often the blooming occurs in a way that we can actually clean up cosmetically. And so uh, one of the steps that we take in the processing the images is to clean up defects and artifacts in the image that are caused by the way that our cameras and our telescopes work. And so we, we are usually able to remove the blooming effect in a way that, uh, that doesn't damage the image. But in some cases we do do many short exposures, but it really is a balance between how much time it takes to do that and how necessary is it. Thank you, Travis. Okay, next we have a question from Leonor. Leonor says, hello friends, is there a technical specialization one can study to become an astronomy imaging uh, image processor? Wow, well, I'll tell you this. So, I mean, what's really fun about astronomical image processing is just all the skills that we use. And so uh, my background is in astronomy. And so I, you know, where I help the most is knowing about the objects that we're studying, uh, how to collect the data, how to process it. And I've learned a lot from uh, many of my colleagues who come from a graphic arts background and so are very good at doing things like cosmetic cleaning and uh, using a lot of the, the tools that we've I've talked about, like visual grammar. So one of the things that was sort of a funny experience for me when, when I was first starting to do this as I started thinking about this issue, well, what makes one image work and what makes another not? And I started coming up with sort of rules and ideas of things to help make a good image. And then I talked with a friend of mine who also makes astronomical images, but she has an art background. And she just, I told her some of my ideas and she said, you know, if you took an art 101 class in college, you would have learned all about that. And so it was just like a really kind of eye-opening moment to realize that, that there was a lot of things that we could learn from different disciplines. So the graphic arts, tradition, you know, traditional arts have greatly influenced the way that I and others have made make images because it the goal here again is to make images that people want to see. And so uh, if you have an astronomy background that'll help you understand the types of things that we're looking at, but also a graphic arts background will help you to understand not only the nuts and bolts of how to use software like Photoshop for the color compositing process and cleaning of cosmetic defects, but also what is the way that you can make an image that people want to look at? Yes, 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 Travis, that is it. Oh, amazing. Thank you. All right. So we have lots going on here in the chat. So some more questions and comments. So I will continue. Um, John says, um, oh, sorry, we'll continue on with after Leonor, we have Mustafa who has uh, another question and Mustafa asks, can we get these images original FITS version? So for most of the images we make, the, the FITS data, which are the, the original processed astronomical data are available in the NOAA, NOAA lab data archives. And so, the, uh, so the, the short answer is yes, these data are available. One thing that I'll mention is, is that for all the images we make, we do outline the, a lot of the details. So we include the, the data sets we use, the filters that we were used, the color assignments and all the other details. So people can see the, the process that went into making the image. Amazing, thank you. Um, and yes, I have dropped the, the link to our image gallery in the chat several times. So um, I'll drop it again, because um, if you joined us later in the chat after I put that link, then it, it may not show up for you. So I will put it back uh, in the group chat in just a moment. Um, and is the, um, the link to that archive, that data, is that also on the NORLAP site uh, that we can get to, Travis? It is, and I can go find it, or if, uh, if you or Rob have it handy, that is something uh, that you can just post in the chat. Let me- Okay, we'll post that in the chat. Let me just pull it up right here. 
And, and of course, we will post it with the video when we actually post the edited video to shortly. So it'll be in the okay. there. That's probably the best Absolutely. thing to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. We'll definitely do that. Okay. So then moving on. Um, so uh, Eric Gregory, welcome. And Eric asks, how do noise levels and efficiency on research grade cameras compare to average consumer grade cooled astronomy cameras? So uh, for optical cameras, we cryogenically cool our cameras using liquid nitrogen to about 100 degrees below zero Celsius. And that all but completely eliminates the dark current. We have a dark current of about an electron an hour, so basically none at all. Uh, whereas commercial grade uh, cameras do have, they are cooled. Usually it's cooled by non-cryogenic means. And so they do have a dark current that you have to worry about as part of the image processing method uh, process. So that is a major difference between our optical cameras and the ones that are uh, amateur grade. Yeah, usually amateur grade cameras are cooled about 30 to 40 degrees Celsius below ambient with thermoelectric coolers. Is there yeah. a way to buy an additional cooler that could um, help bring that temperature down further? Basically, no. Uh, CCDs have to be are built to, to withstand a certain temperature range. And in fact, for our CCDs, uh, if you got them any colder, they would break. And so uh, if so, anyone gets any ideas about taking, uh, you know, a, a CCD camera that they've bought and saying, oh, I'm going to dip it in liquid nitrogen and see what happens. Uh, you're about to lose a lot of money. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up, Travis. Okay, so sure. we aren't going to do that. All Sounds right. good. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for that question, Eric. All right, so uh, Benjamin Floyd says, uh, excellent talk. What software or libraries do you use to create the multi-band composite? So there's two main programs that we use. The first is a program that we've pretty much written ourselves along with collaborators. It's called FITS Liberator. And it's a program that turns the FITS data files into grayscale images, uh, TIFF images. And then we load those grayscale TIFF images into Photoshop. And Photoshop is where we do the color compositing. And so what we do is we adjust the brightness and contrast in each layer independently. We assign a color to each layer, and then when they're stacked together, you get the final color composite. And then we do cosmetic cleaning of that final image to remove the blooms and other art uh, cosmetic defects that might be in the image. So, so Photoshop and Fitz Liberator are our two best friends. Amazing. Yes, yes. So I, I know, I assume plenty of people have heard of Photoshop, but the, the Fitz Liberator uh, is definitely new for me. So hopefully, mm -hmm. <laughs> Benjamin, that uh, gives you uh, at least two ideas of what you can use uh, for sure. And Fitz Liberator is a free program, a free, free plug. Is it a plugin for Photoshop, Travis, or is it a pro standalone program? I can't it's remember. Fitz uh, Liberator is a standalone program, and uh, it is available for free. You can, if you just Google Fitz Liberator, take you to the website. I will mention that we're almost about to release the next version of it. So if you go to the website and you see that it's an older version that may, may not run on the latest operating system, especially on Mac, uh, just, just wait a few weeks and the next version will be out shortly. So, uh, but the nice thing is it, it is free and it's, it's a very powerful tool. Photoshop, however, that. is not free. Right, it's very, not. Very much not so. It is good that these resources that you're working on are available for free. And so uh, mm -hmm. certainly uh, those in the chat who are interested, um, make note that update is coming for sure in the next few weeks. And I'll be sure to put that in the video description as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. We have lots of thank you, thank yous in the chat. And we have one of your uh, collaborators that you mentioned earlier who works on your, uh, on your team, Jen Miller, who mm. uh, works on some of these images with you as well, who's a, a colleague here at uh, Gemini North, and she gets lots of claps here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, Jen, um, and thank you for tuning in. We are glad to have everyone, including our NORLAB colleagues here with us today and every time we have a live from NORLAB. 
Okay, so Eric says, thanks for a great talk. I'm gonna share this video with any of my friends who ask about how astronomy images are produced. Excellent stuff, Travis, excellent stuff. Thanks, Eric, I appreciate that. Um, and we have um, one question here from, not sure how to pronounce this name, but the, the question is, what are your thoughts, um, Travis and Rob, on using PIX, PIX Insight, P-I-X Insight? So PIX Insight is a very popular program that's used uh, by a lot of amateur astronomers for processing images. I have never used it. And so I'm not the right person to talk with about this. Um, one thing I'll, I will say related though, is um, there, are, there are a wide range of tools out there that can do all sorts of fantastical things with images. And many of the uh, beautiful amateur images that you see out there use uh, PixInsight and, uh, and it really is a powerful tool. So I highly recommend checking it out, even though I can say I have no experience with it. Now, a good question to ask is, is what pieces of software do we choose to use or not use? Or more particularly, um, how do we decide what sort of processing that we want to do? And I'll say that in general, we tend to be a little more cautious about how we process the images. And the reason why that is, is that our images are representing the data products and the science that are coming from our telescopes and observatories. And unfortunately, the word Photoshop has become synonymous with trickery or forgery. And we want people to know that the images that they're seeing from our telescopes, uh, from our observatory, accurately represent the data that's coming from our telescopes and accurately represents the science. And so, um, so one of the, so as a result, we tend to be a little, little more cautious, I guess, in, in how we process our images than other people. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying that images you see from other places or, or forgeries or anything like that. There's just, um, we've just as an organization have designed, decided to be a little more cautious because we, we understand that our images are also representing the integrity of the science that comes from our telescopes. Thank you so much, Travis. And with the, uh, oh, actually I wanted to ask Rob, do, um, you do a lot of photography, amazing things. Have you used PixInsight? I have not made it to PixInsight yet. Uh, to like Travis, I've heard it's a great program. I've also heard it's had a fairly steep learning curve. So at some point in the future, maybe I'll get there, but I'm not there yet. All right. So for everyone in the audience, thank you all so much. Um, we have um, Zolt in the uh, YouTube chat who, who says, great presentation as usual. Thank you, Zolt, we appreciate that. Um, and just wanted to say hi to Travis and to everyone else at NORLAB, so aloha. So I just oh. wanna take a moment to say Zolt is the man who taught me many of the things that I know today. And many of the beautiful images that you've seen from the Hubble Space Telescope come from Zolt and, and the other people that he's worked with. And so thank you, Zolt, for tuning in today. It's great to hear from you. That's amazing. Yes, Zolt, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your knowledge and teaching Travis because we are definitely appreciative of all of his amazing skills. So thank you, thank you, Zolt. Okay, uh, we have um, another question, quick question from Mustafa and I think we have two minutes left. So Mustafa says, is it convenient, uh, is, is, is it convenient DS9 for processing of that so program? DS9 is a, is a useful program for uh, looking at FITS files and, FIT, and DS9 can also output, uh, can create TIFF and JPEG files that you can then use in Photoshop. But it's, it's a lot less, uh, has a lot less functionality than what FITS Liberator has. And I'll mention that when I first got started, uh, we use programs like DS9 but we recognized that we wanted to do a lot more with the data than, uh, than what those programs allowed. So I love DS9, I use it all the time for a lot of different purposes, uh, but I think FITS Liberator, well, I know FITS Liberator just has a lot more functionality in it for, for processing. So uh, I recommend you take a look at both and, and see what you think of and which one works better for you. 
We appreciate that insight. Um, and in the last minute, we have another question. Travis, you you have got everyone's attention and excitement going. Uh, so um, Osman, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Osman asks, what amateur astronomers can do to contribute in science, especially in the astronomy field? Really quickly, um, Travis, what's one thing amateur astronomers can do to contribute to, to this field? Wow, there's not, there's, uh, that could be another hour itself. There's so many okay. amazing things that amateur astronomers can and are doing to contribute to astronomy. Uh, there's a lot of work that's done in variable star observing, something that's been done historically. But one of the things that really has amazed me about what amateur astronomers are doing right now is looking for low surface brightness galaxies and nebulae. So one of the uh, nice, I mean, when it comes to our professional telescopes, we have really big telescopes. So we have an advantage in the size of the telescope, but we have a huge disadvantage in the amount of time we have on them. We may only have an hour or two every year. Whereas a lot of amateur telescopes, uh, amateurs have really nice telescopes and they can use them all year, every night for as long as they want. And uh, so amateur astronomers have made some really incredible images where they're combining hundreds of hours of data on objects. And in the process, they're actually able to see very faint, low surface brightness nebulae and galaxies uh, that we just simply don't have the time on our telescopes to do. And so that's, that's an example of where amateur astronomers are actually surpassing professional observatories in, the kinds of, uh, in, a, in that kind of work. That is actually exciting to hear. Um, and hopefully that is uh, an inspiring answer for you, Osman. All right, so thank you so much everyone for joining us in the YouTube audience, whether you submitted a question or comment or not, we appreciate all of the support. Over to you, Rob, for our wrap up. Well, actually, Jamaica, I was gonna say, first thing I was doing my wrap up was first of all, thank Travis for a great talk. We had lots of comments in the chat, obviously, and uh, comments and questions. And uh, Jamika, do you want to tell us what uh, next week's live from Noir Lab will be? Because I believe it comes from Gemini, correct? Yeah, so next week, live from Noir Lab will be here in Hawaii from Gemini Observatory, uh, which of course is a program of NSF's Noir Lab. And our science guest will be Andre Nicola Chene. He will be speaking to us about the new Gemini card game, which is online now. We've had the Gemini card game for a while. And uh, through this game, you can really experience what it's like to run a world-class observatory. And now that it's online, uh, Andre is gonna come back and talk to us about it. So uh, tune in next week this channel same time live from noir lab thank you so much and we hope to see you next week okay thank you very much jamaica and thank you again travis thanks everyone and thanks for all the great questions yes and we will see you next week's live from noir lab bye everyone aloha